Right. The question is, what's the homeland? And what happens to the people who actually have a home, who actually live somewhere, when someone else comes in and claims that a biblical claim, for example, makes it their homeland? I have no claim to Israel being my homeland. For me as a Jew, it's not my homeland. I don't come from there. No one in my family comes from there. I, my family was from Russia and, and the areas around uh, Latvia and Lithuania for as far back as, we, as anybody knows. I don't think, even for those who believe that biblical claims have some validity, I don't think that God writes real estate contracts. I don't think it works that way. And I think that leaving out the indigenous people who live somewhere uh, because someone else comes in and says we have a moral claim based on what someone else did to us somewhere else doesn't work. I don't think it works. I've worked on the issue of ending the Israeli occupation, for instance, for, well, way longer than I care to remember, um, basically since I stopped supporting it when I stopped uh, being a kid, I guess. But what I do differently now, what I've done differently for these last 10 years, through, mainly through the U.S. campaign to end Israeli occupation, is keep the focus on U.S. policy, rather than focusing on Israel's doing this. Yes, they are, and we have to stop that. But what I'm concerned about is what is the U.S. doing? We're paying money for Israeli violations. We're providing protection in the Security Council. We're making sure that Israeli uh, nuclear weapons are not talked about in the discussion of proliferation around the world. Next call for Phyllis Benes, about 15 minutes left. St. Clair's, St. Clair Shores, Michigan, Harrison, please go ahead. Hello, C-SPAN, thank you for taking my call. Uh, my question is concerning the Israeli occupation. Uh, I happen to be a <coughs> old uh, secular Jew uh, who has his heart with Israel since this whole thing began. And uh, I know very little about everything concerning it, but I have one question that plagues me, and that is uh, Israel took occupation in my understanding, is they they became occupiers because they were attacked uh, by either just the Palestinians or a, a consortium a consortium of Arab states. Uh, why are they so criticized for the occupation in view of the fact that they were attacked? Well, thanks for your question. It's a very good one. I assume that you're talking about the 1967 occupation. There's a school of thought that also says that when Israel Create, was created in 1948, that that was also a kind of occupation of Palestinian land, albeit uh, approved partly by the United Nations. Israel, of course, ended that war with, in 1949 with 78% of historic Palestine rather than the 55% they had been granted. But in 1967, they took over the additional 22% that was left. There is a, what I consider a myth in this country, it's a popular one, that says that Israel was attacked in 1967. In fact, it was not. In fact, Israel and, and the Israeli historians all bear this out. Israel attacked first. They attacked the Egyptian and Syrian air forces first. They wiped out the entire uh, uh, Egyptian air force in one day in what became the Six-Day War. Uh, it was in response to Egypt having told the UN that they wanted the UN troops, the, the uh, border observers, to be removed, which was their right. It was a provocative move, but it was their right. But they had not attacked Israel. Israel attacked first. So part of the criticism is for that, but the larger part of the criticism is for holding on to the territory. And that's why Resolution 242 of the United Nations, which you hear a lot about as what should be the basis for solving the problem, Resolution 242 is very clear in its preamble. It says that it prohibits the acquisition of territory by force. It says there can be no acquisition of territory by force. So the whole point is that in a war, in a battle, in a fight, war creates changes in territory. Somebody ends up with land they didn't have before. The point is you can't keep it. It's the keeping it that now is the major violation. And if you look at UN resolutions, if you look at the international law, you look at the Geneva Conventions, the obligations of an occupying power are based on the idea that occupation is a temporary phenomenon. So if you look at the most recent reports of the UN's special rapporteurs on the question of, of, of uh, human rights in the occupied territories, for instance, 
they are proposing that the International Court of Justice examine the question of whether this kind of long-term occupation, in the case of, of the 67 war, we're now looking at 43 years of occupation of that territory, which the UN itself said is illegal, that that should be considered as something different. It's a different kind of violation than what the Geneva Conventions anticipated back in 1948, 49, 50, when they were being drafted, which was the idea that there would be a short-term occupation during which time certain obligations apply. That there's an entirely different, new, more significant violation at stake here when the land has been annexed and stolen and permanent buildings put up, walls, villages knocked down to build Israeli settlements. And that's continuing day by day. So when we hear from the Obama administration, we want a settlement freeze, for instance. To me, that's simply not sufficient because it doesn't deal with the ongoing violation of having half a million illegal Israeli settlers. Illegal because the Geneva Conventions, Article 33 says, uh, sorry, Article 49, says that the occupying power, Israel, may not place its own population in the occupied territories. That's illegal. We now have 500,000 Israeli Jewish settlers living on these illegal settlements, breaking the law simply by waking up in the morning. That's a huge problem that goes way beyond, do we stop the settlement activity now? What do we do about what already exists? That's why this thing becomes so complicated. Greg Garrison emails in from Riverside, California. As a peace activist, what, if anything, have you done to secure the release of Jalad Shalit, the IDF soldier kidnapped from a sovereign nation by Hamas, a terrorist organization? I have repeated over and over again, and I will now, that Gilad Shalit and every other prisoner should have immediate access to the International Committee of the Red Cross. I would ask Mr. Harrison, was it? Uh, Garrison. Garrison. Uh, similarly, I'm curious what work he has done to secure the release of the 11,000 Palestinian political prisoners currently being held by Israel. I hope that all of them can be visited by the Red Cross and immediately released. Rockville, Maryland. David, you're on. Please, well, please go ahead. For, thank you for taking my call. And uh, C-SPAN is great. Uh, I've always loved you guys. On one specific thing, you ought to try and bring another person in to talk about the legality issues of the uh, uh, settlements and all that. Uh, uh, because I, I do think... Uh, uh, I do think she is misstating the facts the, uh, about the, uh, the the restrictions on settlement. That's why the U.S. has never said they were illegal. She said they're not, they're not helpful in bringing about the, the uh, a solution. But as a more general thing, I, uh, uh, Phyllis is, and, uh, has always used the term ending the occupation. But doesn't there have to be another symmetry to this? You can't end the occupation without ending the war against Israel. When when Israel signed a treaty with Egypt, she gave up land for peace. When Israel signed a treaty with Jordan, she gave up land for peace. The problem is the Palestinian Authority, the, the PLO formerly, and now Hamas, are obstacles to peace. And if Israel were to give up land like they did in Gaza, it would lead to a disaster. <clears throat> Well, I appreciate the, the uh, comments. First of all, the U.S. government has on occasion said that the settlements are illegal. Um, and they, in, a, in a, a legal finding by the State Department back in, I believe it was about 1986, I'm not sure the exact date, there was a whole finding on the illegality of, of the entire settlement process. Um, but I think that the point is that Israel has an obligation to withdraw from territory that Ill it illegally occupies, which includes all of the West Bank, all of Gaza, and all of Arab East Jerusalem. And I think that, first, on the political side right now, the PA and Hamas have both indicated their willingness to accept a two-state solution. Hamas, on a, what they call a long-term basis, which they said could last up to 100 years. The ceasefire with Hamas, for instance, was holding uh, the, the ceasefire that in, in uh, 2008 was holding until it was violated on November 4th of that year by Israel, which led to the deterioration of the ceasefire and then the Gaza war. So I think the question is, under international law, Israel still has to end its occupation. Phyllis Bennis has been our guest this month on In-Depth once again. Here is her list of books. Beginning in 1990 with Stones to Statehood, 
edited two books, Beyond the Storm and Altered States. Calling the Shots was published in 2000, Before and After 2003, Challenging Empire she wrote in 2006, and then she began a primer series published in 2009 and 2010. Here are the four primers, Understanding the Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, Iraq War, Understanding the U.S.-Iran Crisis, and End Ending the U.S. War in Afghanistan. If you go to ips-dc.org, you can find access to all of those books. Thank Absolutely. you for being on In-Depth. Thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure.